Hi, everybody. Welcome to Talkward. I'm Marty Dundix, Editor-in-Chief of Weekly Humorous Magazine, and this is Talkward, a fun little show where professionally funny people come to tell awkward and cringeworthy stories. I'm very excited about today's show. Um, this is someone who I have not met in person before, but we've exchanged a lot of emails, and I've read so much of his stuff, and I'm excited to talk to him today. He is the former senior editor and senior writer at The Onion, as well as a writer for McSweeney's and The New Yorker. His book, Welcome to Woodmont, was named one of Vulture's best humor books of 2022, and the satirical sex manual, Sex, Our Bodies, Our Junk, Publishers Weekly described it as hilarious and addictive page turner. His newest book is Grief Strike, The Ultimate Guide to Mourning. Please welcome Jason Roeder to the podcast. Hello, Jason. Thank you Hello. for coming on TalkWord today. Hello. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> uh, how is sunny California? It is um, actually the sun has come out after about a week, about a week of uh, relentless uh, gloom. It just kind of uh... you guys got some snow and weather out there. I think everyone in L.A. kind of goes crazy when it starts raining. Um, and I can't imagine how you guys were when it was snowing. Yeah, there, there, there were uh, actual snowflakes on my windshield. Um, I know. I know. Um I'm glad that I've lived in colder climates, but uh, there are people who just couldn't function. There were people who just um, thought it was some sort of apocalyptic event. Because, it, you know, out there, when I have occasionally gone to Los Angeles, I'm over on the East Coast. I'm in New York City, uh, where it gets cold. You go out to Los Angeles, and it's like 65, and people are wearing, like, beanie hats and, like, scarves. And they are just like, oh, my God, it's not, it's not sunny 72. What am I going to do? And they start kind of freaking out. And when you guys drive around, there's no, like, sewers or something? Like, the water just fills up and doesn't seem to go anywhere? Well, no, sewers haven't come to L.A. yet. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there, 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 there's discussion about it. But uh, right now, we just use buckets and trenches and any sort of hole in the ground we can think of. So, so you are, but you are an East Coast originally person, right? Right. You right. are a transplant. You're one of those East Coast writer comedy people who is like, I'm going to sunny California. And uh, and then it's different for people who actually are from California. Like they're just like these sort of sun people who are just living in this bubble of silliness, I feel. And then the East Coasters that migrate, they have a different kind of edge to them in L.A. where they kind of know what's going on, but they are kind of playing mm -hmm. California. Well, the good news is that I grew up mostly in Florida. I mean, I spent a couple of years in Massachusetts, so I was I was I was softened up uh, yeah. when I came out here. So I you were had half baked no, already. Yeah, I was ready. I was I, I I was ready to just kind of melt into the sort of vulnerable population of L.A. So yeah, there was no like rough uh, hide that had to be sort of chipped off. Nope, <laughs> I'm weak. I was weak the day I got here, and I still. You were am. already. You were already kind of gooey from Florida, so you were gooey in L.A. Here in the in the colder northeast, where we have kind of a shell, we have kind of a hard, angry shell uh, that slowly melts off when we go to L.A. And then we no, think no. to our, we think to ourselves, maybe we'll just move out here, and then you shake that off after about two weeks, and then you come back to New York. Um, well, I, I wanted to. Um... I wanted to be a pioneer. I thought, what if I moved to Los Angeles, California to pursue my writing? Entertainment. Um, yeah, Los you, Angeles. And you thought I would bring entertainment and comedy to Los Angeles. Right. And people said, that Los Angeles? I said, yeah, that Los Angeles. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so I've been here uh, <laughs> four and a half years somehow. Wow. Well, that's nice. Where in Florida were you before you moved to L.A.? Uh, I, I grew up in a place called Coral Springs, which that is sounds, a, That sounds lovely. They all sound lovely. I, <laughs> my, 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 my theory is that they're named after the uh, habitats that had to be eradicated to sort of build 
the suburb. So, um, <laughs> what habitat and what environment did we completely wipe out to make this subdivision? Right, exactly. Coral As a Springs. tribute, right? We didn't forget you. Um, but uh, which and and that's a uh, south uh, that's South Florida. The uh, it's a suburb of Fort Lauderdale. Basically. Absolutely love South Florida. I go down to a delightful place called Lauderdale by the Sea mm-hmm. for like a month. And it is in between Pompano Beach and Fort Lauderdale. It's it's for, just retirees and me. Yes, that's. I mean, th- there are three or four months out of the year where Florida is perfect. Um, if you don't talk to too many people, it's you don't talk to perfect. anybody. Don't talk to any of the people. But lie on the beach. I love like. There's no waves. I'm used to like. Um, East Coast beaches, which are nice, but they're bigger waves. You right, can get really totally, choppy. Yeah, you can get just creamed by waves. There's stuff. Um, you know, there's people drowning. There's people swimming, and there's undertoes. There's all kinds of stuff you have to be aware of. Like, the ocean's always trying to drag you into it and, and, and keep you. But in, in South Florida, the water is just, like, flat. It's just, there's no lifeguards like where right. I am, like I'm like, why is it there's like nine thousand lifeguards where I go to the beach on the East Coast, and then you go to Florida, and it's like have fun, hey, just have fun, just right? Kind of, just kind of float. There's no waves. It's like glass, you know. Nothing, nothing is going well because because they're so soft that the slightest bit of choppiness would break <laughs> break you in half. Um, so I, I think, yeah, yeah, I think that's another reason why. Uh, why we're so soft because we haven't been toughened up and you by, grew up in florida mostly um mostly. i i moved around i i was taken around by my uh my family i was born in new york and then i moved to north carolina and then to massachusetts and then finally my parents were like oh florida seems like a great place to stay and stop moving so i moved there when i was i think nine when the police stopped chasing you guys you were like we can lay low in florida this is where no one will come looking for you. Right. I, I, well, I, I feel like, you know, I, I, the, the FBI just is like, oh, if, if they stay in Florida, that's fine. <laughs> just contain them there. And it did, did, did the Florida um, growing up and did the moving, like what influenced you to become such a funny comedy writer? Your stuff is so, you're so clever. And um, I've, I've read a bunch of your, of your stuff from The Onion and I read a bunch of your headlines and, um, you know, the the Welcome to Woodmont College uh, College Guide parody that you wrote with Mike Sachs is so funny. And then um, Grief Strike, uh, the ultimate guide to mourning. I mean, onion stuff, funny stuff. This, you know, college comedy, funny stuff, very clever. You've even found a way to make the the saddest stuff that a human will ever have to deal with. You did make it funny, and you made it honest, and you obviously went through your own mourning period and your own experiences to write this book because there's so much truth in the sincere parts that you wrote about yourself. But the but the jokes in this book are so funny and sharp, Thank you. and and um, we can get all into it. So so tell me about how did how did Florida and your family make you a funny person? Like what caused you to be that? That uh, that comedy writer. What what made you want to do that instead of like I don't know engineering or becoming an architect or whatever it is that we end up you know spinning a wheel when we're in high school or middle school and we're like I think I'm gonna right. be a I want to be a Ghostbuster or I want to be a whatever. What well, made you want to be a comedy person? Well, I I knew it wasn't gonna be an engineer because I was really bad at math. I mean I was put in a special row for people who were bad at math. It was actually called the snoozer and loser row. Um, what grade was this? What grade was this? This, this was uh, tenth grade. Tenth grade. Uh, it was they, also known. They were as... allowed to shame us a lot more in school than they are now. I I didn't mind the amount of abuse that I received in grade school. It probably helped me. I thought. I mean, I, I didn't get beaten or anything like that. Like they didn't actually hit us physically in in schools at that time. But mm-hmm. they would make you move your desk places as punishment. I remember that. Really? All right. Yeah. yeah, we do that too, actually. Like they put you in a row because you were slow. And it was like, those are the people that are uh, dumb. And maybe you got kind of called out because of it. I remember talking too much in elementary school. And I had to put my desk up because we would be in just regular rows. And I had to put my desk up right against the 
the wall that the chalkboard was at. Like I was sitting at the like I was staring at the wall. Everyone's behind me, right, looking at me, and I'm just sitting at my desk. And that was the punishment. Like you get you get called out, and your desk is now way over here, like an idiot. And everyone's like, "Hey, look at that idiot." But I just reveled in the attention. Like I'm like, you have no idea what you've unlocked in me because now I am the center of attention. I'm in the front of the goddamn class, and everyone's kind of laughing. And I'm just like, hey, everybody, look where I am. I'm at the head of the class. Yeah. I'm at the yeah, head I, of the class. I'm the winner. And they're all like, I, you're not getting it, Marty. <laughs> I'm the I'm the I'm the apex. Can't exactly. Mean, who's here? And who's <laughs> over there? Who's um, on top? Top yeah. dog, right here. Um. So I I, I knew really early on i wasn't going to do anything like that um i i thought i might be a journalist for a okay. while so you were um, a strong writer always i i i didn't really know that there was a path to comedy writing i didn't know what it was um because this was like the early 90s um and there th th there was no internet um at all there were no internet publications so what could you do um so my plan was to become a journalist, um, casually become a journalist, which is the, the wrong way to approach that profession. Like you, you have to maybe on the side. Yeah. I'll, I'll just, um, I'll just, that's, that was the plan in a way. And so I went to journalism school. Um, did you write for high school newspaper, middle school newspaper? Yeah. That kind of stuff? I, I had a, a column. I was the, look, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to brag too much, but I was the news editor of my high school newspaper. And um, if you like jokes, you're going to love this joke. The name of my column was writing off the wall, not writing on the wall. You've heard the expression, the writing on the wall. I took it. I took it to a whole crazy place by calling it writing off the wall. So I would have, I would have called it rotors writings. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's short. <laughs> that's branded. That's yeah. Punchy. Yeah, I mean, um, next time, next time. Yeah, I mean, I've I've, I've reread those columns, um, and you know, in, in many places, they're as unfunny as the name of the column itself. <laughs> but um, did you go but, at it like I'm going to be a zany editorial opinion person? Like I'm going to be like the Andy Rooney of my high school newspaper. I I went at it surprisingly because I'm 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 just so like mild, but in. I, I went in, like, I wanted to have, like, an edge to my column mm -hmm. um, for some reason. So, like, I, I came out strongly in favor of um, Desert Storm. Like, I had okay. this weird... Um, you were like a war hawk. Look at you. It's like you and John was, Bolton. You're like, but, yeah. But, you know, it... But then that same year... I didn't know who I was, obviously, because I was in high school. I, uh... I... I, I dropped off a note to the principal of the school because he was urging the student body to support our troops. Um, and I wrote him a note and I said, I thought that was inappropriate. Um, that, uh, that wasn't his function as principal. I didn't really have any principles. I didn't even know what thoughts were in my head. Um, and he called me down to his office and I was scared. And I recanted everything. I recanted. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. So um, that's me as at 16 in a nutshell. <laughs> I was fun, though, doing those things. Like, I worked, um, I I drew a cartoon. I drew cartoons for my elementary school newsletter. I was drawing Whoa. silly three-panel cartoons way above the, the comedy. Like, I was making jokes about Dan Quayle. And, wow. and they were basically just jokes I ripped off of watching Murphy Brown. Like, that's kind of like, really? yeah. And then in high school, I worked at the high school newspaper. I was the art director, and I did the editorial cartoons, and I wrote movie reviews. Okay. So I got to write movie reviews, and that was fun, and they were always kind of silly. And then I wrote editorial, I did editorial cartoons, and I made fun of school administrators. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, they were real editor. Like I was, I, I pissed people off, and I got I got called down to the office because I was always making fun of people who were in charge. But the fun thing was, the guy called me down to the office, who was the um, administrator, and he he made it he made it me feel like I was in big trouble. But he actually wanted a original signed copy of the cartoon that he framed and put in his office, and it was up for his entire like career. I made oh. him look like a turtle. It was terrible. It was so insulting, but he liked it and thought it was funny. Um, 
I love just uh, it was fun playing. I remember I, I played you know high school newspaper. I got to kind of flex like humor muscles and just like art muscles. I went to art school. And then in college, I worked at a college radio station where I got to do, like, morning radio type, being a silly, you know, goofball. But it was like, you know, it's not a real job. So you're kind of just kind of feeling out, like, who am I? What am I doing? What's my sense right. of humor? Who are my influences? Um, so when you were in in the, the high school newspaper and then um, later on in, in, in college, like, when did you find, a, find your comedic voice and who did you read and like to kind of mold your point of view or, or your style of writing? Was it just like Onion? Was it was it always Onion was a main influence? I mean, The Onion became an influence. I mean, when I, um, my first real grown-up job um, was at a Berkeley College of Music. I was their in-house editor-writer. Um, communications department was it's a nice, steady job, and it's a yeah. fun place. And um, But I was the guy, pre-Twitter, pre-everything, who would um, just send around Onion links it was, it was how I kind of started my day. And, you know, these days it's, they will post job listings on their website and their writers are on social media. But back then it was kind of a black box. You're mm -hmm. like, how does one do this thing? I would very much like to do it. I had no idea. Um, and so, I mean, and then so the, I, this was, I guess I was like 26 or something at the time. That was a huge influence. That was the yeah. thing I really wanted it to do. That and Letterman, those, those are the two things that um, I really, um, really wanted to find. Like I, I'd heard that, you know, when you wrote, wrote for Letterman, like you just come into work and you write top 10 jokes and you write some desk bit ideas and if he likes it you write that if not you just keep writing those jokes in your in your little cubby all day long and i'm like that sounds great to me that sounds like hell to some people but yeah i'll just sit in confinement i'll just sit um alone and write jokes like that um and then did you work home. at letterman no i would have loved to um no that one uh that one eluded me um i worked at letterman as a part-time employee i wasn't a writer i worked in the audience department when I first came to the city, it was a part-time job. It was um, wonderful. It helped me pay uh, my rent. And I was an illustrator for a weekly, alt-weekly newspaper called the New York Press. And it was it was like a lifetime, a lifelong dream of mine. I was an art major, so there was I had no in in the internship world from right. college. Like there was no reason for them to ever hire me for anything. Like I, I had no experience. So I got a job as a part-time person, just like bothering people on the street. If they wanted to go see the show, we'd have extra tickets or whatever. So it was fun. And it, it was exactly what you're saying. It was people just like huddled doing their writing and they would write. We would have a thing, a big thing that they would pass out. So we would see the entire um, possibles, all the bits, everything for that show. Like I have a bunch of them from when I was there. It'd be like show number 2206. And, and it would be like everything for the show would be like all the jokes, all the desk uh -huh. picks, everything that was put in. And they would only use like one tenth or less of what was actually written that day. But you would have this huge packet of stuff that people, you know, submitted and worked and they made they made graphics for it. And then, you know, Dave would just go off on a tangent and they wouldn't use any of it. It was he would do the he would do the his jokes, he would do the monologue, and they would do the top ten, and then maybe they would do like one other thing, and then then like twenty things get thrown out the window. So to be one of those writers where you're, you're writing every and it gets accepted and then they just don't do it over and over and over again. That that's hard. I mean, the, the, the onion, you, you you write so many jokes and so if you get in that you get used to. But the idea yeah. that you've written something and it's produced essentially and ready to go and then that gets cut. Yeah, um, they, and they always that's cut something stuff. they cut stuff for time. And maybe maybe if it's timely, if it's not timely. Maybe it'll get in another time. Like maybe they'll play a game or whatever. Um, right. It, I think it's total. It's totally different now with Colbert. The way Letterman ran it. By the time I was there, it was like a machine that just sort of like he would just do what he did, and the writers would give the material, but they would kind of just kind of talked off the cuff a tremendous Ooh. amount about whatever. Right. <laughs> Right. Everything is very scripted now. I feel like in late night when you watch it, it's like we're talking about this now. We're moving on to this now. We do right. You know, we have five to hit... minutes with this right. guest. We have to hit it's... these markers and yeah, yeah. So how long were you um, full full blown in the Onion? So you were um, senior writer, senior editor, 
What was that experience like? Was that in person? Was that all remote? It was in person. Um, I, I, I've had a, a couple of stints, so I, I took a break like between a couple of them. Um, I um, the first one was in uh, New York. Um, I was I was I began as their uh, as an editorial fellow. I don't know if they have that fellowship program anymore, but it's like an elevated internship. Mm -hmm. And I was the world's oldest um, fellow by like 15 years. <laughs> Just a 34 year old wondering <laughs> if he made the right decision. Um, um, yeah. Um, I mean, it was, it's, 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 it's great. I, I, I learned um, so much about joke writing. Um, very I quick. Learned... You're a very quick quip writer um in the books i mean in the grief book grief strike um now this book is you know it's so depressing to talk about topics like this right like death is so sad everybody wants to avoid talking about death and um, right. it's inevitable and it's coming for all of us and we you know as much as we don't want it to happen you know, all of our loved ones are, go are going to die and we are going to die. And then the people under us are going to, it's so sad, Jason, it's depressing. Why That's are you talking? I've... Why are you talking about death, Jason? Come on. Anyway. It's, it's the only thing, ironically, it's the only thing that makes me feel alive. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the only thing. So um, I have to, I don't know what's after, after this, I don't know what else I'm going to talk about. So yeah, th this is hard to follow up. Um, book wise, I would think, uh, you've covered some topics that maybe you know, the next thing is going to be like a really funny cookbook. I mean, that's true. Like, well, I, I can't go back to like a, a, a dating book. Like, I, I, or maybe I can, I don't know. Um, I think you could, I think you could get, yeah, I yeah. mean, a dating book is fun, especially right now, the amount of crazy apps there are. Um, but with the death stuff, I read, um, this is, I feel like this is so... This is so like on on the mark when it comes to the kind of book that would actually help someone who's dealing with something that's that's so sad, you know, like Thank you. there's there's nothing you can say to someone really to make anything better when no. their loved one has passed away because come on, you're not going to so the only thing you can really do is is distract them for a little bit and add levity to this very sad event, which is just to be silly. And, um, you know, you, there's all these kind of, you know, there's by reading your book, I'm aware of all of these different, you know, real grief books and real grief calendars and all these real things. But ultimately, what helps is jokes and humor. Like, I feel like uh, so much of humor is only used to bring levity to serious situations, you know? Right. And, you know, dark humor and joking about these things that are so terrible, like, so much of humor has been invented because we have to inject something that's not so depressing in our lives to make them okay and able to move forward. Right. Um, and this is, I mean, this book is so funny. It's got so many things that are so true. And you obviously wrote it from, you know, firsthand experience. And you're so like, <sighs> when someone dies, it's terrible. But the things that happen directly after you get th it's it's almost like someone someone you love dies and then you get you have to throw a you have to a plan an event, right? You have and to. It's the worst. You're just like I'm 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 mourning something terrible just happened. I cannot believe it. Oh, I have to plan a party now. Jesus Christ! <laughs> it's like I have like, to plan a if, function. As if this couldn't get any worse. Now I have to plan a party. Oh, and then you have to think about who's going to come and you have to think about food and catering and and all of the things that come with funerals and services and speeches and who's going to read this passage from this Bible or whatever. And it's a lot to have to go through. Yeah, it's it's I mean, when people think about this moment, they think about this kind of like cloud of sadness which is true of course but they also but they don't consider because they haven't been through it um the absurdity of it and and the logistics of it because someone yep. dies and and you you remain and you have to um you know you, you 
you have to go to a funeral home and, and, and watch a PowerPoint and picking out a casket for someone. Oh, the picking you, out the you casket. Love. My grand, uh, I, uh, my two grandfathers died in their 70s. And when I was just graduate, I was just about to graduate college and then one right after I graduated college. And they went earlier, earlier than their wives. And then both of my grandmothers made it to about 90 and mm -hmm. died in the, within the last five to six years from, from now. So they were around for a long time, and I was really happy. I got to cherish that time with them. And um, so when when they passed, it was, oh, like, I mean, and that's more in recent memory, and I was, old, I was older, so that I was like mm -hmm. a part of that, where it was like we have to go to the funeral home, we have to go through all these books, you have to go, you have to go into this like showroom of caskets and you're like i don't i mean what is this inside what is this I'm, made of like i'm, I'm going cares? shopping who cares what the inside of this casket is made like it does that doesn't matter at all but there's it's like buying a car like the things that they are putting like the the add-ons and the materials that these caskets are made of and and you're like i don't know does it matter if it has bluetooth i don't understand what what am i getting here but you do i mean i I surprised myself at how I sort of thought about these things because like what one of the options was a pine box. And I was like, a pine box? What, what, is this the old West? Like is, is an undertaker going to put her in a pine box? But of course she doesn't care. And so, you know, we thought, okay, well, this is, this mahogany casket has some dignity to it, but it's not so expensive that she would have been outraged um yeah that we spent that kind of money she would never um, have approved that and if you can maybe get a coupon yeah she would be I mean, really happy that you saved a couple of bucks like that's how i her. would be be like if is there a deal is it is there like a tuesday deal is there something that we could make in to like sweeten this pot a little bit that makes it feel this is like something that she would be like, oh, this is actually a pretty good deal. You should go. Yeah. Is, is there some promo code or, or something? That, is that there a promo could... code? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's, 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 it's just a really crazy moment. And I, I wanted the book because I, I have nothing to offer in terms of training, in terms of no. um, well, hundreds of hours. You have. An experience. Yes, I have my that experience. You went through, and you've made it to the other side. You are still a functioning adult, and you have maybe dealt with your grief by writing a book. A little bit. I mean, you know? it, it it's it certainly helped me regulate it because it gave me a purpose, and it gave me um, a distraction, and it gave me a a goal. Like maybe this book will be of some use. To people um and so in the months after she died i started writing this like five months after she died um it gave me a, a direction you know um because this was during the pandemic um i wasn't working so i had a lot of time alone in my apartment and um i had to find a task that was Urgent, ur urgently, I had to find a task. Um, and since I have pretty much one uh, one skill in in the world, which is jokes, I thought, okay, well, we'll go in this direction. And you use those that skill very well, Jason. I was actually um, speaking to a friend of mine earlier today on the phone who has lost both of her parents in the past two and a half years. Wow! Yikes fairly suddenly one less suddenly but both i mean terrible huge and so she you know she's been dealing with all kinds of grief. i mean this is exactly the kind of thing that she had to go through she had to go through all of these funerals all of this stuff all of this you know and you know with small kids and all this stuff and i i was telling her about this book and i was i was like you know i think i'm going to give this book to you because this book is really it's useful in a way that's different than like a sympathy or grief guide it is a book that's just mm -hmm. like levity it's just jokes and I, I actually read the 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 part of the book that i was there's so many little i mean just like from picking out a tombstone and the kind of font that you put on the like all these little menu like all these little details that you added were so funny and the one that i was reading to her was know your hospital televisions yeah yeah you spent a lot of time watching tv 
and I'm going to read just a little bit of this. That's it says uh, you're stuck all day in the hospital room. The internet connection is spotty, and you're you'd feel weird about using the public Wi-Fi to sell your rhino horn sex elixir on the dark web anyway. You brought a book, but you're just too fuzzy right now to take on the heavy lift of Rob Lowe's memoir. Your only option for some much-needed distraction is the sweet oblivion cube mounted on the ceiling above you. But not all hospital room TVs are created equal. And then there's six tiers of the hospital TV that you're going to encounter when you are visiting your loved one in the hospital. And hospitals are so gross. And we don't spend very much time there normally as regular people. Other people who work in, you know, medical fields do all the time. But you don't go to the hospital very much. And then you go, and it's like they got the big, weird, heavy doors that have the weird handles on them. And, and everything is just strange yeah. and Institutional. Foreign. It's yeah. very institutional. Everything kind of smells like, I hate going to hospitals. You're going to catch something. My my dad uh, hates going to the hospital because he's like, I don't know. I mean, it's all, it's all full of sick people, Marty. Why do I, why do I want to go to a hospital? Um, the tier one, most functional basic cable with some kind of hazy wobble here and there. Tier two, buttons on the bedside remote only work to increase the volume, not decrease it. Vast expanses of empty blue screens, although main channels are intact once you find them. I, I'm skipping the tier five. The television not only doesn't work, but every attempt to operate it breaks another television in the hospital. Press the on button long enough and you will eventually break every television in the world. Ugh. So funny, yeah. Jason. And then at the bottom of, of the of little sections of the book, you have a sincerity corner where it's just you being honest about your grief and your loss when your mother passed away. And it's really honest. And it's like, you know, it feels the thing about the book is it feels so real because you're writing from such a real emotional state as opposed to some self-help guide, which kind of has this feeling of bullshit, you know? Right, or, or 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 just emerges from, you know, um, like clinical practice and not personal experience, and which is also a very funny thing to note. I've I, the reviews on this book are very good, and there was one review that one was guy. There was one guy on the Amazon page that's like a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a psychoanalyst or something, and he was not happy with the book. He was like, this book is not helpful for me clinically at all. And it's like, I can't believe how much of uh, of a point this guy missed the entire reason of the book. Like, he, totally. He did. And I, I really took pains to keep people like that away from the book. I mean, that's why <laughs> yeah. there is a giant disembodied fist punching through a tombstone on the cover yeah, that's why, you know, the reviews are from comedy people. Um, I really wanted to make sure that people like him who wouldn't respond to this book and also people that just don't want to read a humor book at this moment um, stumble on it. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I, I also think throughout the book, I put words in the mouths of grief therapists. Um, I do that a fair amount. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, it was, it, it felt inevitable. Fortunately, it's just been that one person so far. Um, Rating your grief with the chili pepper system is a great, uh, I mean, this, this stuff is so clever, Jason. It's so, you know, what do I do with all these sympathy cards? Right. Um, it's just, it's like the reality of dealing with death. It's not, you know, it's not like the movies where it's just like it happens, everyone's mourning, and then people move on. Like, there's all this stuff, right? There's there's packing. There's, when my grandmother passed away, both grandmothers were in the same old folks' home. It was called Friendship Village in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And mm. um, I had to live in the old folks' home after they had passed away while I packed up their lives. I, I packed up a one bedroom. I slept on a cot and I was living in Friendship Village for a week, going wow. to the dining hall, eating the food plan. Like I lived in Friendship Village as I packed up uh, my grandmother's life. And, and it was like um, it was a sad comedy. Like everything about being there was a set was it was this like tragic comedy because it was everything about life. Even if there's always so much f humor in 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 drama because it's like this juxtaposition of what you're used to, what your normal life is, and then you get thrown into something that you're not prepared for, and you're just trying to deal with it as best you can. And that's so much of 
death and, and funerals and mourning is like we are unprepared for what has just happened, even though it is constantly re- reminded that people are going right. to pass away. Every single day, so many people die. And it, it's, it's nonstop when you hear celebrity deaths, like and people are reporting it on the news. Like, it's, it's all around us all the time, yet we pretend like it's not happening to us. It's, it, it, you know, someone very close to you dies. And you know, in, in some ways, you know, I, I think about death, obviously, now that my mother has died more than I have in the past. But still, it's always, it always feels like a thousand miles away. Um, there's, I, there's no real bridging that gap, I don't think. I mean, you're alive or you're not. Um, and you know, may, maybe until the day you die. But then, of course, by the time it sinks in, it's it's too late for it to sink in. It is. I think as we get older, Jason, we 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 I I am in my forties now, and I'm just realizing that I am not in my twenties. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm now jumping from I'm not twenty anymore to I'm almost sixty. Oh my God, it's over. You know, like. <laughs> More than half of my life is probably gone already, and I don't even remember most of it. And that's how most of us live, you know. Oh yeah, I mean, I I, I just turned fifty, and I, I'm uh, under what? No, you yeah. look amazing. You look. Oh, what are you kidding you. me? I would have said thirty eight. That's why I told. Thank you. That's why I told you. Um, <laughs> I and I, I'm under no illusions about my life being halfway over. You know, it's um, if I live to be a hundred. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't want to know what that looks like. I mean, my God, I mean, my God, my God. So there's always interesting things that happen. I remember um, when I was at my grandfather's funeral, when I was probably like 20 years old and, and there's a lot of, I mean, I have a, a there was a comedy writer for weekly humorous. He's a, he's a humor writer. Who's also a, um, he works in a. He's a. He's a, a character uh, undertaker. He's a. Uh, he works for a funeral home. He like runs a funeral. He's like a a, 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 a mortuary. What's it called? Mortician. 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 So he works in the, in the industry of death, and he has a podcast called Mortified, and it's just like the 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 funny stuff about working in the uh, funeral home industry where all these things probably happen. He has to deal with uh, grieving families all the time. Um, And just all the little things that go wrong. And I was thinking about, when I was reading your book and thinking about talking to you, I remember when I was at my grandfather's funeral, we were, you know, the whole idea of the funeral and seeing the embalmed uh, person in the casket and people visit them and they're just like sitting there and it's just like, so they're just like lying there. And it's also morbid to me. And I, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of the, of the, uh, open casket. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm still on the fence about whether or not I'm just going to get, um, cremated and put into a, a jar and then someone can just put me on their mantle for a long time or throw me in the ocean or, or whatever it is. I don't know. I, 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 I think I'm ready to be, um, disposed of and any, any, any way that seems even halfway kind of reverent you know okay. that's fine we're gonna that's shoot fine. you out of a, we're gonna shoot you out of a cannon <laughs> i mean you, it, sure as long as you know you, you find where i landed you know um and you know gather me up and um maybe like planting me in as a, a, a in, in like a tree i think that would be kind of an interesting thing if you could just kind of plant, like yeah. I could become part of a tree and then i could live forever as, as like some really old oak tree i think that would be kind of fun um well yeah i mean right some sort of continuation you yeah know, something I, that makes I, me I think I, I feel like but i remember when i was a kid and i was at the funeral and we were leaning over my grandfather's casket my sisters and i were like doing our thing where everybody kind of goes and visits and we were having our time to go and visit and we were leaning and looking at him and and he, you know people don't look the same um, when they've been embalmed and stuff. They look different. And his mouth started to open. Oh my lord! Uh huh. Because when I guess they do the thing and they do the stuff, they like put something in the mouth to kind of give the face like a fullness, like a piece right. of it's like, it's like plastic or something. So there's something in his in the face to kind of keep the shape. And whatever was holding it together became unsealed and he started opening his mouth up and you could see this like piece of plastic inside of his mouth and we were like oh god pops is trying to pops is trying to talk to us 
So we had to tell the funeral director, like, hey, he's he's opening his mouth. And they had to be like, oh, no. And they had to be like, excuse me, we're going to freshen the flowers for just a moment. They, like, close the doors. And they had to, like, go to work on them. So it's, you know, the whole death stuff is so morbid and strange wow. and unfortunate. Well, at least they uh, reacted. At least they weren't like, yeah, they do that sometimes. I they, uh It was terrifying. And I remember it to the, I can remember exactly. Like, there's, like, things that are just burned into your memory, and you're just like, oh, God. Um, but this book uh, kind of takes that kind of look. It kind of twists, you know, the reality, the reality. So how do you feel now that you've written this book, Jason? How do I feel? Um, well, I mean, I, I'm i glad I wrote it. I, I've heard from people now that's out in the world who've read it and who've you know, who used it in the way it was intended, you know, as, as kind of a, an insane companion. Um, and, um, it's like a funny for, it's like a funny death buddy. Yeah. It's, who, who can kind of help you without like, I don't know, talking to you too clinically, you know, too clinically, or, or that there's also a certain tone. There's a, there's a certain solemn tone that you encounter when someone dies. And of course, why, why wouldn't you encounter that tone? I mean, what are people going to do? But um, I feel like it can become a bit smothering after a while. And the book is, is completely different. Um, you know, and it's for people who just are a little tired of it. They're grateful. They're grateful for all the, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so right. sorry. I'm on um, that part right now. Common condolences ranked, right, which is exactly. great, right? It's like tier one, solid compassion. I'm so sorry for your loss. Tier two, well-intentioned dipshit talk. This was God's plan. Time heals all wounds. Tier three, making it so much worse. If you need me, it'd be really streamlined things if you went through my assistant. Don't worry. You'll be reunited with nothingness someday. Tier four, basic human decency is beyond them. This was God's plan. He told me months ago, and I deliberately didn't tell you. Remember, the only pain your grandmother's feeling now is what the devil is inflicting. Not helpful. It's no, not a helpful no, no. thing. No, do, do, do not say those things. Do not say those things. Unhelpful. And exactly. then uh, something that was also very interesting, and one of these things that now pops up everywhere is breaking the news to Planet Fitness, your post-mortem notification checklist where it's like people have subscriptions and people have social media accounts and people have all this stuff that now someone has to deal with all of these affairs that maybe we didn't have to a long time ago. And now it's, and you have a great list of just like real ones. And then you have, um, uh, I mean, you know, social security administration, banks, email providers, and then Jim, that's going to need to see the original death certificate and video testimonial from the county coroner in order to even consider not auto-charging the next monthly membership fee. And even then, it'll take five additional billing cycles to actually go in effect. I mean, I can't quit a gym, and I'm alive. I'm I'm telling them I want to quit. So how how do you, um, how does a dead person, uh, you know, free themselves from Planet Fitness? I, I don't know. I don't know. And also, it's so strange. People make, like, when they have, um, like, bereavement discounts for airlines, stuff like that, and they make you give all this documentation, and it's so absurd because it's like getting documentation like that is so, it's so hard and difficult and awkward. Like, you've got so many things going on. They're like, I'm going to have to, you know, see, you know, photos and death certificates and notes. Like, you literally need this stuff to get, like, a discount on JetBlue or American Airlines or whatever if you're going to get like I don't even know if they do the right. discount anymore but they used to do like a discount for funerals and they That's... make you show so much evidence they're like you are you are you lying to me about this funeral you have to go to and then you have to show them a bunch of stuff right and 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 you are in no condition to uh do that kind of research you know exactly it's, like, it's, it's the last thing last you thing know? I want to do you're so tired it's like I just want to so get on the plane yeah or you have to like. Um, I had another friend. I I had to go to another funeral not too long ago of another friend whose father uh, passed away, and it's like they had to. Um, they were doing. They were moving. They were doing another funeral someplace else where there's actually being. He was actually being, you know, buried next to 
the wife, so they couldn't move the cat. They couldn't move the body to three places. So at the funeral that I went to, there actually wasn't a body because the body was en route from the other place because oh. moving because moving a body is very complicated paperwork wise. So it's like they couldn't move it around, and it was too hard to do. So there was just like a big photo. All that kind of stuff. Like having to like transport remains is a very complicated system. Right. And it has to be done, it has to be executed perfectly. You know, it's not just like, you know, an Amazon package. Exactly. Know? And the people who are, who have to plan all this are having the worst day of their lives and they don't have, you know, so it's a lot of, it's a lot of stuff, you know, having to deal with something so depressing and sad and life changing. And then you have to do all this paperwork and think about all this crap that you never wanted to do anyway. Right. It's, it's the worst convergence of like tragedy and paperwork, you know, um, like exactly, which is why everyone should go pick up grief strike, the ultimate guide to mourning. Agreed. 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 How long? So tell me all about the process of writing this book. Like where, how did you kind of break down the funny in, in what you had experienced? Um, I, I just started thinking about, um, because, you know, Jason, laughter is the best medicine. But a lot of times, medicine is the best medicine. Oh, my God. That's true. <laughs> um, I, I, I just kind of thought about my experience, and I thought, okay, well, um, and, and, and things I'd encountered kind of like foraging through the Internet, like looking for bits of you know, inspiration or, or insight or wisdom or something. And the things that kept coming up, um, in my own experience and from what I read, I thought should go in. So, you know, things like picking out a casket, that's just what I did, you know, um, things like the hospital televisions, that was just, you know, what I did just sitting, um, in, in hospitals, um, looking up at, in the corner of the room at whatever the box had on. Um, and um, so, yeah, so, so it was just kind of going through it moment by moment and thinking, okay, um, what was this conversation? What can I extract from that and make it feel kind of universal? Um, and, and, you know, as, as the process kept going, I sort of took notes like, oh, okay. Um, now that now that we're going through her stuff, I could use that. Um, and it turns out that's um, obviously not an uncommon experience at all. So yeah, um, it was just kind going of being through the stuff. I remember going through the stuff, and it's like, who wants the stuff, and who's going to take the stuff, and and um, I remember because my my mom has. Uh, three other sisters so they were all kind of going through my grandmother's and i was trying to organize like who wants this stuff you know and she had all this like you know chunky rings and jewelry and a lot of antiques and a lot of stuff and a bunch of people took the stuff they wanted and then they were kind of like okay the rest can, can go to consignment and i was like no way it can't, it can't right. possibly it's, it's not going anywhere if, if you know if no one wants it i'm packing it up in my car and i'm taking lolly's junk back to brooklyn with me so um, the aesthetic of my apartment, Jason, and is maybe grandma chic. Um, I have now, you know, stuff from uh, my my grandmother uh, Mimi, and I have stuff from my grandmother Lolly, and it's kind of like a mix huh? of just like antiques and art, an art and chandeliers and all this stuff that like was there, and then maybe it didn't have a home. I piled it right. in my little my little old SUV in Pittsburgh, and I drove it all back to New York. <laughs> And I shoved it in my house, so I've got yep. so much stuff that. Um, and I remember, like people didn't want the rings. My grandmother had all these like costumes, and they wanted some of the rings, but like people didn't. They were like, "Oh, I guess I, you know, I don't need that." I don't. So I took all of the rings, and I brought all of these like fun chunky rings to the funeral, and I passed them out to all of the female members of the family if they wanted. So like oh. you know, like from from young from young kids to you know the the, the grown children and stuff, everybody wore. Like a big, fun, chunky, you know, jewel, you know, ring to the funeral, and because Lolly always wore these big fun ring, so everybody had a big fun chunky ring, and they got to keep it, and they wear it, and oh. they remember. But like nobody wanted it at first because they were kind of like, I'm too overwhelmed with grief. I don't care about stuff. Right. I don't want to. And then later on, you care about stuff, and you're like, God, I really wish I had. 
So now I have all this stuff, and I, I constantly will give it to, you know, my sisters or my mom to be like, oh, yeah, this, this was a bangle bracelet or this was whatever. Like, nobody wanted it, but I still have this little hoarding chest of old grandma jewelry that I pull out every now and then. I'm like, here, here's some, here's some stuff to, to, to yeah. wear or whatever. And it's fun. And, um, you know. And now I'm they a, can. I'm oh, a big it's... antique collector. So it's like, I think oh, things. You are. Okay. I'm, I th- I never buy almost anything new. I'm I'm cheap and I like buy- I like old I like old stuff. I think old stuff has a story to it. So I have a lot of family heirlooms, and I always love to have stuff from, you know, family members and things that have been passed down. And it makes you kind of like it has like a bigger story, and then that's kind of yeah. how I that's how I deal I guess with with remembering people that have passed away is having their stuff nearby, and it makes me feel closer to them i have um a sort of library of voicemails my mother left um you know she was she was a visiting nurse and so she would always call from her car um like just everyday stuff she's calling from cvs she's calling on the way home like what do you need me to pick anything up um birthday messages um and I didn't realize I had that many, but I've got a bunch. Um, and to me, it, it, it's a way of experiencing her, well, in life, alive. Um, oh, absolutely. Voice and, messages are amazing. If you can, if you can remember yeah. to hold on to them. I lost a bunch when like my phone crashed. I lost some stuff from my grandmother. And, um, but then I did have a bunch of, like before people were doing a lot of like the story core or a lot of the podcasting, now people will maybe have conversations with with older older relatives to kind of remember the stories from the old days and before that was happening i just had an iphone and i would ask my grandmother questions about stuff i know she would talk about and i would just have my phone on record and then she would just go on and start talking about something that happened in like you know the 50s or something or when she first met her husband when they were like teenagers or something and she would just start talking and i would just put the iphone on like the memo and i would just record her and i just would just have things on record all the time and she was she's just like telling stories and and then i'll forget that i even have them and i'll stumble onto them i'm like oh my god this is from like such a long time ago and then i'll hear the voice again and you, you're just like wow it's it, that's the amazing thing about recordings you're just like it's like they're right here yeah and especially with voicemails it's like because they're talking to you with this intention of just like I'm leaving you a message. And it's and it's such an, an an immediate moment, you know, it's not it's not any kind of memorial, it's not um it's not a big occasion, it's really them as you experience them. Yeah. Um and uh yeah, I mean, I I I really I I'm glad I I held on to them and I'm glad I um they somehow survived all my various phone migrations. So you got to make sure they're backed up. I, I send things to my Gmail as like attachments. So then even if I screw up and lose my phone or something, they're still in the email somewhere. Yeah. And then I go and I, I'll like Google and try to find like attachments, MP3s or whatever. And then I'll find a bunch of stuff. I do the exact same thing. Gmail is my, <laughs> is my, is my cloud. It is the cloud. You can, like, I, even before they started really, I guess people were doing, I always just email stuff to myself as a way to like idiot proof. You know, because I would lose stuff and not know where it was. And I'm like, I'll just email it to myself. And then, so I just have all these emails from myself and they all have attachments of stuff that's important. But then I forget to like write a subject line. So they're all just like, <laughs> yep. up there. I'm like, I'm like, I have no idea when this was. And I have to go through like a time, like when in my life <laughs> did I send this email? Like what was happening in my world? I have to ask myself what like 2010 Jason was doing, what what, what he was thinking. Exactly. But, um, you know. God, get inside his mind. I, I can't do it anymore. What was I doing? What was what was my life like in that time? When would I have sent this? Yeah. Um, oh God, he's so stupid. I just can't, <laughs> I just can't. I don't want to get in touch with him, but I have to. And that's also kind of the weird thing with grieving that we have as a modern society with all this technology is we we are always reminded of of the past because it is so accessible. You know, like. It's not just telling stories or having a little photograph that you get to look at. You can hear people and you can see people's digital footprint from their social media accounts. And you can see things that they wrote or text messages. Right. 
where it's like you can always it's like they're virtually still there like there's a little bit of their digital personality that will live forever in this little capsule i mean people have actual timelines now i mean people have you know younger people have Facebook. I mean, not that they're on Facebook anymore, but like, you know, from like five to yeah, whatever age they are, start is, to finish. It is bizarre it's to see crazy. people who, who got on Instagram when they were like 10 and they're like adults now. And it's like they have this entire uh, photo timeline of their existence that the whole world can see, which is yeah. nuts, you know? Yeah. And see their story. It's crazy. So you wrote this book. What's the next book for you? What's the next journey? Do you have something else you want to tackle? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I humor books are they're 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 fun to write. Um, they don't change your life professionally, generally speaking. <laughs> um, and I it has taken me a long time to learn that lesson because I've written a few. Um, <laughs> so. Um, I don't know. Um, I would like to write another book. Um, I have to find the right topic. And Well, um, I love this book that you wrote with Mike Sachs. I have it right here. It's Welcome to Woodmont College, and it's a college uh, parody. It's a college course parody for a pretend college called Woodmont College, and it is so funny, and people should definitely go and buy this book as well. It is available on Amazon, and... Um, it's Absolutely. very light. It is just like college course. It's exactly like your typical college course catalog, only it's absolutely hilarious. And it's a great gift for anyone who is working in academic, uh, is going to start a school or works within a school systems or, you know, just like a gag gift for maybe for a, a recent graduate or something. But it's very Absolutely. funny. And um, I look forward to developing this further with you and Sachs in the TV movie realm. Because I could definitely see, I mean, this would be a fun thing to watch be produced because the world of Woodmont College is very funny and hilarious. So I think that's going to be maybe the next big project I see from from Jason Roeder. I would be. I would love to see that, too, with the uh, the great Mike Sachs. Um, but also, I mean, I mean, but this could also be um, a produced TV or film like around the world of grieving because it is something that is so relatable, right? Like this is going to happen to all of us. We've all had to deal with death. So the, I've, I've, the, the lessons in this book are not going to be foreign to anybody. Like they're all going to be what we have to go through. I thought about like how I might adapt that, you know, it's tricky bringing narrative into it with any humor book. You have to sort of, okay, well now let's find a story for it. But maybe it's kind of a uh, documentary, kind of a funny documentary. It could just be, Death I mean, did you ever see, there was a movie in the, I want to say late eighties, called How I Got Into College. I saw it a long time ago. It is yes. a very old movie, and it's very silly, but it's very much like a high school guy, and it's it's his journey to getting into college, and it's so much of it's about, like, the SATs, and it's so much of it is, like, this, this like, how-to guide of, like... All, but it's, it's, it's not just, like, a straight narrative. It's all this, like, wackiness and, like, breaks and little skits and little... Um, you know, videos that are like kind of within the movie itself. So it's kind of like this guide. It's like a live, it's like a live guide. So something like this done for grieving where it's almost like an instructional video on how to grieve, but it's more of a, maybe a narrative based thing. Like we start with this guy who has a loss and then they're dealing with it. And then mm -hmm. all of these different things pop up. But I definitely see this being, um, Something this I think this is definitely I, I I would definitely watch something like this. I think there's a way. I have to figure out what that way is. But I mean, people right. loved Six Feet Under, right? People, I mean, it's a morbid thing, but people definitely get drawn in to that world of uh, the macabre and the the dark and the you know dark humor and and death and and the inevitable and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And For hospitals. Sure. And just like hospital stays or long illnesses, like it's so depressing. But there's so much um, comedy to mine in these terrible things. Like there's so many little funny things that happen in the greater sadness. Uh, that that that's what I'm well hoping. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I there there definitely is, and I think there's there's a way to put that on the screen um, somehow. Sort of extract what is working from the book and kind of make it a uh you know 
a, a Hulu uh, 20, 20 uh, episode Definitely. series. I would watch this. It's going to last forever. It's going to be on for a long time. Definitely on the Hulu or the HBO Max or the wherever. <laughs> um, Grief Strike, the ultimate guide to mourning. Jason Roeder. And where can people follow you? That You can go to jasonroeder.info for your website. Dot, yes, dot .info, uh, dot .com and dot .net were taken. And so I got the elite. I got, I, I paid extra for dot .info. I dot feel .info. Like, yeah, that's where the uh, the best of the best go. Don't go to that dot .com. That Jason Roeder is a son of a bitch. You want to go to dot no. .info where the real Jason Roeder is. Yeah, thank you. Thank no you. No problem. My pleasure. And are you doing, you're writing some short humor for New Yorker, McSweeney's type people also? Yeah, from time to time. Um, I I have uh, four writing friends. Um, the guys I wrote the sex book with. Um, <laughs> and um, we are still writing together uh, when we can. Um, and so... And how'd so, you meet those guys? That's Is that Sax and, and more people? Sa- Sa- yeah, Mike, Mike, Mike uh, unites people. Uh, I met them... Um, uh, this is uh, Ted Travels. Ted's got Jacobson, Todd Levin, um, and Mike. Yeah, through Mike, um, and uh, we wrote the sex book together, and um, we still we write lists for the New Yorker now from time to time, um, and um, it'd be great to do something more substantial. But um, and how how do you guys work together? Are you are you all over the place, and you work together on like a Google Doc, and you kind of like share space. We we just send emails back and forth. Uh, probably is not um, the most efficient way to do things, but it's just what we are used to. And so um, we send in a bunch of jokes. Somebody sort of gathers them up. Yeah. And we then spit them uh, in at the New Yorker and um, and see if they go for it. Well, that's wonderful. You can uh, people can want people can read all of your past stuff at your website. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so go over to jasonroder.info and read uh, Jason's uh, past uh, writing for the uh, McSweeney's and for The New Yorker, and you can see a bunch of his stuff from The Onion, and you can see uh, links to buy his current books that are out now. Um, the Welcome to Woodmont is uh, in uh, in hard copy, and you can buy uh, an e-version and Grief Strike, The Ultimate Guide to Mourning by Jason Roder. Thank you so much for talking today, Jason. It's great to talk to you. Thank you so much, Marty. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, no problem. Uh, I'll see you when I'm out in Los Angeles. Hopefully it won't be snowing, um, and uh, we can we can bask in the, the gorgeousness of, of, of Los Angeles before it all opens up and swallows you. What is it that all you right. said uh, about dying in Los Angeles? Uh, oh, I said uh, if you die, the, the, the sky will be blue, or it'll be clear as you look up. As you look up from dying, it'll be a, a beautiful, like, 72 degrees. Something like that, yeah. Something like that. All right. Uh, well, thanks for uh, watching and listening. This is Talkward. Please subscribe and um, and check out weeklyhumorous.com. Thank you, Jason Roeder. Uh, Thank you. Talk to you later. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>